Hi there, and welcome to the Alberta Update, a look at what's happening in your province. I am your host, Bruce McAllister. Thank you for being with us today. Uh, Coming up, we're going to chat with Rebecca Schultz, the Minister of Environment and Protected Areas, about the federal plastics ban being shot down by the courts, and also Canadians wanting to axe the carbon tax. Those numbers are growing right across the country. Minister of Tourism and Sport, Joseph Scow, is going to pop by to talk about economic recovery in the tourism sector. Minister Nate Glubish will be along to highlight the major investments and advances that we are seeing in Alberta's tech industry. And Minister Dale Nally will join us to talk about a recent uh, trip to Texas and some of the investment that Alberta is attracting uh, to our province. All that and much more to come on the Alberta Update. Well, the days of soggy straws may be numbered. Uh, Alberta has been fighting the, uh, the, uh, the federal government in court over the plastics ban. Our province arguing the decision to unilaterally label plastic as a toxic substance is unconstitutional and a threat to our economy. Canada's uh, courts agreeing they've ruled the plastics ban is both unreasonable and it's unconstitutional. Minister of Environment and Protected Areas, Rebecca Schultz, joins us now to weigh on this. Welcome, Minister. Thanks so much for having me again, Bruce. You bet. Listen, Minister, uh, Ottawa's chomping at the bit on this one, aren't they? Um, They already say they have plans to appeal. Uh, What are your thoughts on the ruling and their plans to try and get this ruling changed yet again? I mean, look, I was optimistic when I heard the ruling from the federal court saying that this plastics uh, labeling as toxins were uh, both unreasonable and unconstitutional. I think it just reinforces what we've known all along, that once again, the federal government is infringing in areas of provincial jurisdiction. They're completely ignoring the Constitution. Uh, But, you know, these rulings and and of course, I'm sure we're going to talk a little bit about what we saw just a few weeks ago with uh, Bill C-69 and the Supreme Court. I mean, It shows me that uh, the courts at the federal level want to uphold the Constitution. I mean, this gives me hope for the future of Canada. But, you know, how the federal government thinks that they're going to, you know, tweak their legislation now uh, around the edges when, you know, in this case on plastics and and like we saw in Bill C-69, federal courts and the Supreme Court in in that case saying their laws are unconstitutional. I mean, at at some point, um, you know, they really should take a a long, hard look at, at what they've been doing to Canada. All right, let's follow up on that. As you say, this is the second time the courts have uh, have overturned uh, decisions made by the federal government. What kind of message do you think it sends to Justin Trudeau and the politicians in Ottawa? And frankly, are they listening? You know, they haven't been listening. That's that's what we're seeing. I mean, when it came to Bill C-69, uh, the Supreme Court was very clear that we still have a constitution. It needs to be respected. Uh, you know, that, that these uh, pieces of legislation that they're putting in place uh, have huge economic consequences and complete disregard for our constitution and our p- provincial jurisdiction. Yet, we continue to see Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, Environment Minister Stephen Guibault, just completely ignore uh, what's being said by the courts and, and saying that they're they're going to tweak um, these pieces of legislation. Uh, you know, we issued earlier this week, I think it was a seven word response to the media saying, look, we, we will see you in court, Minister Gibo. Listen, it sure seems like the prime minister has lost the plot on the carbon tax. Uh, obviously, uh, support is growing across the nation to axe this tax. This since the uh, federal, since the car vote was announced uh, for home heating oil. So what are your thoughts? Uh, what are your thoughts on that issue? Yeah, you're exactly right. I mean, look, when we saw the federal government provide a carve out for heating oil in Atlantic Canada, first of all, we're happy for Atlantic Canada. We know that the carbon tax is increasing the cost of living on everything uh, in our day to day lives from gas fuel, uh, utilities, groceries. And so we were happy for Atlantic Canada's that they, uh, Canadians that they got a carve out. Now, the issue is, is when they admitted, when they, when they did this carve out, they admitted that it was because it was driving up the cost of everything. So again, it was really an admission by the federal liberals that their carbon tax, it, it, it's just a tax. It's not having any impact on emissions. It's not reducing emissions at all. And that's why we introduced a motion in the legislature Uh, that, of course, our NDP didn't support for uh, essentially to push the federal government Mm -hmm. to axe the carbon tax across the country. 
It just seems so bizarre, the, the, the Prime Minister picking winners and losers on this one. Listen, uh, one more question, I'll let you go. Uh, COP28, that's the UN's climate change conference. It's coming up at the end of the month. The Premier will be there. You will be there. What will your message be to those attending? Yeah, that's a good question. First, I want to say, as you said, the, the federal government's behavior was bizarre. I, I would just I would just reiterate that, you know, it, it is uh, a pattern that we're seeing with the federal liberals as their climate plan is falling apart. They've set unreasonable targets. They haven't worked with provinces or industry. Uh, and so we just we continue to see them both uh, flailing in the polls, I would say, and then making these knee jerk reactions when it comes to policy. So uh, it is bizarre, but I think that's that's what happens when they see themselves um dropping uh, essentially they're in free fall in the polls and uh, the, every aspect of their climate plan is being picked apart whether it by, be by provinces uh, or you know even with what we've seen on plastic straws this week at the federal court now when it comes to cop uh, Premier Smith has been very clear. We are going to be the ones taking Alberta's message to the rest of the world. Uh, we cannot let Justin Trudeau and, and Minister Stephen Guibault be our voice on this front. We are doing an excellent job. Uh, our industries are doing an excellent job of reducing emissions, and we want to show the world that we can produce emissions while still growing our economy, protecting jobs, and meeting the energy needs uh, that we're seeing worldwide. Alberta is part of the solution, and uh, that will be the message that we take to COP next week. Here, here, Minister of Environment and Protected Areas, Rebecca Schultz, joining us. Uh, always appreciate the time, Minister. Thank you. Thank you so much. Well, billions of people on this planet do not have access to reliable energy. Alberta could be a huge part of the solution. Uh, the Premier sharing that message re recently at a conference with the Business Council of Alberta. Uh, it's the same message that she intends to deliver at COP uh, later this month. Here is a sample of what the Premier has been saying. I'll tell you what the Alberta message is. It's the one that I gave at the World Petroleum Conference as well, is we have uh, 2.2 billion people on this planet who don't have access to energy. We have an energy poverty problem in the world. We have to have the joint goal of bringing up people to our standard of living at the same time as re we reduce emissions. We can't trade off one for the other. We have to do both. We have an obligation to do both, and we can do both. And I will point out forcefully that Alberta has resources that the world needs, and we can produce with lower and lower emissions. I am going to emphasize that energy abundance and affordability are compatible with sustainability and that we can transition away from emissions, that we will not be transitioning away from oil and natural gas. And we're sending that same message to Ottawa and all Canadians relentlessly. The truth will carry the day. Our government will never stop uh, spreading the truth or standing up for what's right. In other news, we know that organized crime is a problem here in Alberta, right across the country for that matter. Alberta's government is committed to holding perpetrators responsible because people have a right to feel safe in their communities and in their neighborhoods. That is why Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Service Services Mike Ellis is, uh, is expanding the Safer Communities and Neighborhoods Unit to tackle problem properties in southern Alberta. Alberta's government knows crime continues to be a a significant challenge for many communities and we are doing everything that we can to make a difference. Sometimes our major downtown urban centers get a lot of attention but our rural and mid-sized communities are also seeing concerning trends. That's why today we're taking action on providing law enforcement agencies and necessary tools to combat criminal activity. This includes uh, using all means at our disposal to fight crime, which is why the Safer Communities and Neighborhoods Unit of the Alberta Sheriffs is such a valuable asset. I am pleased to announce a new team of six scan investigators from the Alberta Sheriffs will be based right here in Lethbridge. This is a new regional team that will cover an area roughly uh, bounded by Vulcan to the north, Crow's Nest Pass to the west, and the U.S. border to the south, and the provincial boundary with Saskatchewan to the east. This announcement means faster responses and resolutions, ensuring concerns are addressed in a timely manner, and providing the support that communities deserve. Today's announcement is in line with our government's plan, as announced in Budget 2023, 
to double the size of the SCAN unit and establish a new regional teams in strategic hubs. Since its inception in 2008, Alberta's SCAN unit has investigated more than 8,000 properties and issued about 100 community safety orders, exemplifying its steadfast commitment to ensuring community safety. That is Minister of Public Safety and Emergency Services, Mike Ellis. Well, more solid business news for Alberta. Alberta is on track for another record year in the tech industry uh, with tech sector investment. Third quarter numbers indicate investment is up 5% over the last year. This is great news for Alberta's economy and diversification of that economy. Joining us with more on the impact this will have on jobs and the economy is Minister of Technology and Innovation, Nate Glubish. Good day, Minister. Hi, Bruce. Thanks for having me on the show. Happy to have you. Listen, Innovation Week just wrapped up. I know you were very busy making your rounds. Um, tell us a bit about what's happening, Minister, in Alberta's tech sector right now. Well, Alberta's tech sector is booming. It's it's so exciting. As someone who spent the better part of 15 years before politics being a venture capital investor, investing in and building Alberta tech companies, I can tell you there has never been a better time to be in tech in Alberta than today and we're just getting started. You know, you talked about investment numbers. Uh, just to give you an example of how good things are going, in 2017, we only saw $30 million of venture investment into Alberta tech companies. Last year, we had $729 million, and we're on track to beat that again this year. We're seeing exponential growth at a time when the rest of the country's tech investment is on the decline. Alberta's bucking the trend. Yeah, fabulous news. Keep up the good work. I know you wouldn't take all the credit, but uh, I know you've been working hard at it. Listen, you just launched a new uh, pilot project in Alberta with Starlink. For those that don't know, tell us more about what Starlink Starlink is and what this project will accomplish. Yeah, absolutely. So Starlink is uh, an internet company for rural and remote areas. They offer it through low earth orbit satellite technology, and it's really exciting. It's one of the most advanced in the world today, uh, and they're making some very significant investments to grow their satellite network. And so, uh, you know, why, are, why is this of interest? Well, uh, for those of you watching, if you aren't aware, I'm responsible for the government of Alberta's broadband strategy uh, that we launched in 2022 with the goal of making sure that every Albertan, wherever they live, will have access to reliable high-speed internet by 2027. We've made a $390 million commitment to invest in uh, connectivity infrastructure to get the job done. We secured matching funding from the feds to help us get there. Uh, but you know what the problem is, Bruce, is despite the feds giving us a commitment, they've been so frustratingly slow to work with. And it's clear they're playing politics. You know, you, you just had uh, Minister Schultz on talking about the carbon tax. And we all remember recently when, uh, you know, the feds carved out the carbon tax on heating oil in Atlantic Canada, but they're not doing anything for Alberta. And and when Minister Goody Hutchings, the Minister for Rural Economic Development in the federal government, was asked about it, she said, well, maybe you just need more liberal MPs because that's how you get things done. Well, th that's my counterpart on the broadband file. And so you can see clearly they're playing politics, they're being slow. So we got to try something different. So we're doing a pilot with Starlink. I'm really excited to get rural internet out to more folks in remote areas of the province. And we're hoping to grow that soon. All right, a clear theme here with the federal government, no, no question about that. Just the other day, the Premier and Minister Sani announced an investment, I believe it was $125 million uh, into McEwen University School of Business. How will this and similar investments in the province impact Alberta's innovation industry? Oh, it's going to be so important. You know, McEwen is a great partner for us uh, as a post-secondary institution, training some of the next generation of talent. And one of the most important things I hear uh, about from leaders in the tech sector and business leaders uh, in our community is we need more talent. We're growing like crazy. We're going from 10 people to 100 people to 1,000 people. And there's no better place in Alberta to do that. But we need more people. And so uh, I'm so thrilled to be supporting uh, that our government is supporting McEwen's plans to grow. And you know what, Bruce, we're just getting started there. Every single post-secondary institution in the province is working on a plan for growth because we know that Alberta is booming. We know that hundreds of thousands of people are coming to Alberta and we're going to need to plan for that growth and we're going to need to grow our post-secondary institutions. I'm thrilled to be supporting that. Uh, and I know that that those investments are going to uh, boost our tech sector in a big way by making sure we can access some world, some more world-class talent. Um, we, we already trained some of the best people in the world. We're, we're just going to do more. I know how busy you and Minister Sani have been on, uh, on this file. Uh, Minister, listen, thanks for taking some time. Appreciate you joining us.
Thanks for having me, Bruce. Minister of Technology and Innovation, Nate Glubus, joining us. Well, speaking of technology and innovation, Alberta's government looking to attract more investment in new and emerging industries like hydrogen. Minister of Red Tape Reduction and Service Alberta, Dale Nally, joining us now to talk about a pilot project that the province is participating participating in, easy for me to say, and some other things. Good day, Minister. Thanks for stopping by. Good morning, Bruce. How are you doing? Doing great. Listen, let's, <clears throat> excuse me, let's kick it off with uh, some news on your recent tour. You were in Texas yeah. uh, drumming up investment, talking about all the things that are going on in Alberta. Tell us a little bit more about what you were able to accomplish there and some of the conversations you had. It was a great tour. I mean, we went down with the Canadian Blockchain Consortium, and so we just had some great meetings. We met with uh, BitDeer, which is one of the, the biggest uh, uh, crypto miners in the world. We met with Core Scientific, which is uh, setting the standard. And, and, and just seeing the, the investment attraction that they're generating in Texas and, and seeing the opportunity about how we could translate that into, uh, into some uh, in investment uh, in Alberta was very exciting. We had some great conversations. And, and I can tell you that uh, Alberta is on the map. For sure. Maybe Minister expand on that. Why why is Alberta uh, such a such an appropriate destination for crypto mining? Well, we um, I mean, it, you know, there's always challenges and 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 opportunities on the on the challenges side. Of course, we uh, we we don't want uh, Bitcoin miners necessarily uh, plugging into the grid because, of course, because um, uh, of our, our hostile federal government, we we have some capacity issues right now. But we have so many opportunities behind the grid and off the fence. It's it's uh, it's it's worth noting. We've got uh, thousands of orphaned and abandoned wells that could be pressed back into action. For, uh, for data mining. We have uh, flare gas opportunities. And this is an incredible one, Bruce, because right now we have industries that, of course, are flaring. And, and they're flaring methane, which, as you know, is 80 times more damaging to the environment than carbon. Well, if Bitcoin miners want to capture that flare gas and use that to mine. So they're, they're basically uh, going to um, be, be consuming the methane. And, 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 uh, and, and so it's going, to be, uh, it's, uh, it's going to have a lower carbon footprint than the current flare gas, and it's going to be generating wealth. And, and I have to say, in this uh, field, these are mortgage-paying jobs. And so it's quite exciting to see. And, and they took a, a notice to the Alberta Advantage, our message of, of Alberta being a low-tax environment. We have the lowest corporate taxes in Canada. As you know, we're cheaper than 44 U.S. states. And, and in fact, our, our, our taxes are in line with Louisiana and Texas. We've reduced red tape. And our province is open for business. And this message is landing in, in Texas. And, and some of the biggest Bitcoin miners there are, are taking notice and are, and are, are in, in Alberta kicking the tires. Yeah. All right. One more on this subject. You, you spoke with a couple of senators. I know you met with uh, yeah. Ted Cruz. Yeah. I think you also spoke with um, Cynthia Loomis, Wyoming. Yes, Senator Loomis. What? Yeah. Tell, tell us more about those conversations. And, well, great uh, conversations. Uh, Senator Cruz, as you know, spent some time in Alberta. So he's, he's very familiar with the Alberta Advantage. He's aware of our strong economy. We had a, we had a good conversation. And, and in fact, uh, we, we laughed when he refers to uh, Alberta as the Texas of the North. And, and, and he said that, Bruce, because we have so much in common. Our core values of entrepreneurial spirit, hard work, um, and freedom. And those are the kind of things that we share with Texas, in addition to having a very strong economy and being responsible energy producers. I would be remiss if I had you on the Alberta Update and I didn't ask you about hydrogen. I know it's uh, it's a big focus of yours and it's in your mandate letter to try and move that file forward. An update for Albertans on that issue. Thanks, Bruce. I'm very passionate about hydrogen. As you know, I was, uh, I was part of the team that created the, road, the hydrogen roadmap. And, and we know that experts are forecasting by 2050 this could be an $11 trillion industry worldwide. We want to get as much of that investment in Alberta as we pass possibly can. And, and I want to be clear, we're not looking for clean hydrogen to replace oil and gas. Absolutely not. But it's going to be right there alongside uh, oil and gas, creating generational wealth for Albertans. But it's important that we do the right things now. And, and so that's what we're doing. So we created the hydrogen roadmap that sort of charts out the path that we're going to take to, uh, to create both a domestic economy for hydrogen as well as be an exporter. And, and so I'm happy to say the government has received our first hydrogen vehicle. We've got about 3,000 fleet vehicles in government, and we've rece received our first hydrogen-powered uh, uh, vehicle. It's a Toyota Mirai. I have to tell you, Bruce, it's a wonderful car. It's got torque like you wouldn't believe. It's sporty. 
uh, and it comes in a, a nice conservative blue. So when you have a chance, you should probably come take it out for a test drive. <laughs> we will watch. Uh, we will watch that industry move forward, uh, Minister, under your guidance. Listen, thank you. Appreciate the time. Thanks a lot, Minister of Red Tape Reduction and Service, Alberta Dale Nelly, joining us. Well, Alberta's government is set to open the uh, newly expanded emergency room at Edmonton's Misericordia Hospital. This $85 million expansion project will significantly increase capacity, tripling the number of patients that they can accommodate there. Here are some highlights from the announcement. This is truly a momentous occasion, and I'm happy to be here to celebrate with all of you. I know so many Albertans in Edmonton have eagerly awaited the opening of this new facility. Patients and their families will now have access to a modern facility that has been designed with their health care needs as the top priority. Yeah, I said that we went from the most challenging infrastructure to probably the best uh, emergency department in North America. So it's well deserved and you know, our patients will benefit from it. I'm forever grateful for their expert abilities, their patience in helping me understand what was happening to me and their compassion throughout my time in the ER and the ICU. They saved my life and gave me the precious gift of more years with my loved ones, during all, doing all the things that I love to do. You never know, just like Trina said, when you or someone you love might need emergency care. And thanks again to the government's commitment to the new Misericordia ER, and thanks to our generous donors for making the experience the best that it can possibly be. It's the people, the people that work here, the heart, the passion, the care that you give each and every day that makes the real difference. Because otherwise, it's just a building and a structure. To all of you, thank you. Amazing work. And yes, they do deserve lots and lots of rounds of applause. So thank you to all of you. Health Minister Adriana LaGrange also calling on Albertans to help shape the new refocused healthcare system. All Albertans, healthcare workers, patients, caregivers, and Indigenous people are encouraged to provide their feedback. Uh, the province wants to know what works and what doesn't work, uh, the challenges that you have faced, and what matters most to you and to your family. Uh, visit alberta.ca slash healthcare to learn more and to provide your feedback. This week, we recognize National Addiction Awareness Week. Uh, through the Alberta Recovery Model, uh, the government has added more than 10,000 annual treatment spaces since 2019, eliminating user fees for treatment, and is building 11 long-term recovery care uh, communities that will provide addiction treatment at no cost. Uh, Dan Williams, that is Alberta's Minister of Mental Health and Addiction, highlights some of the work our government is doing to battle the deadly disease of addiction. It's National Addiction Awareness Week, and as your Minister of Mental Health and Addiction, I want to let you know what we're doing as a government to deal with that deadly disease of addiction that ravages so many of our families and our homes and our communities. The truth is, there are only two ends to addiction. Either an individual gets treatment, recovery, and a new lease on life to be a brother or a daughter again, or, sadly, it ends in pain, misery, and death. That's why Alberta is rejecting the Vancouver model. We are not going to be facilitating addiction. Instead, we're gonna get people the life-saving support, treatment, and recovery that every single Albertan deserves because of their dignity as an individual Albertan and a person who deserves a chance to be a family member and a friend again. We've invested hundreds of millions of dollars in building 11 new recovery communities across our province. We've invested in the virtual opioid dependency program, which provides same day, no cost, immediate access to evidence-based life-saving opioid agonist therapy. You can access it for yourself or any of your family members through vodp.ca. And of course, we're gonna continue with Counseling Alberta. You can access through 211 for anyone suffering from mental health issue or addiction to get access to the services you deserve. Every single Albertan's life is too important for us to leave just in the balance. We need to support recovery. It is the only way to overcome addiction. And Alberta is leaning heavily to care for every single Albertan and get that chance at recovery in their family and in their life.
Some great news for Alberta's tourism industry. Alberta saw $10.7 billion in tourism spending in 2022, returning to pre-pandemic levels two years ahead of schedule. Alberta's Minister of Tourism and Sport, Joseph Scow, is here to talk more about this great news. Good day, Minister. Thanks for taking the time. Hey, Bruce. Good to be with you. Hey, why do you think uh, why do you think the big rebound? I mean, what is what is behind this? It's fabulous news for the province. Alberta has always had a great story to tell, and before the pandemic, we were seeing tremendous uh, growth in the visitor economy. But since then, uh, Travel Alberta has changed its mandate and introduced what we call the the bootstraps plan that focuses uh, a lot on destination development. And so, as a result of that, and the investments in tourism. Uh, we've seen ourselves get back to pre-pandemic numbers two years ahead of schedule, and uh, and we're looking forward to a very bright future in tourism. Minister, we love to see people coming here. What what kind of impact, can you quantify it, what kind of impact this has on jobs and the economy here? Well, it's huge. Uh, you know, like you said, we're at $10 billion, $10.7 billion, rather, in uh, visitor economy expenditures this year. And uh, we're looking to see lots more of that. We're hoping to get to about $20 billion by 2035. And that's all a result of you know, the aggressive approach we're taking to tourism, expanding things like air access from international destinations like the United Kingdom, France, Japan, um, you know, looking at uh, expanding our product offering outside of the major parks, and the major cities, because uh, you know, this, big, this amazing story that Alberta has to tell doesn't just happen in those areas. They are the crown jewel of the province, but uh, there's so much more to share. And so, you know, it's more better to qualify these. And when we're speaking with tourism operators, how they're sharing their lifestyle and their stories with, with visitors. And it's it's just so marvelous to see. It's really fun. And I've spent my my time since becoming a minister of tourism and sport on June 9th, traveling the province and meeting with the small, medium sized tourism operators and experiencing what they're sharing with their visitors. And I encourage all Albertans to get out there and uh, and see what uh, what some of the rural Alberta tourism operators have to offer. It's really quite spectacular. I know you have plans to uh, to help expand uh, this even more, uh, a plan to uh, to expand the tourism industry in the province. Can you tell us more about maybe some of the highlights of that plan and how you hope to accomplish it? Yeah, absolutely, Bruce. Um, so it really comes down to three things, you know, marketing, expanding air access and destination development. Uh, I just got back from a conference in Hamburg, Germany, speaking with tourism operators and uh, travel agents who love Alberta. Uh, Bruce, some of these tourism operators have actually seen more of the province than I have, which is pretty, which is pretty impressive. And uh, so what they want to see and when people come to them and say, where should we go visit in, in Canada? They point a lot of their a lot of their clients to Alberta because of our beautiful landscapes, the crown jewels of uh, Jasper, Lake Louise and Banff. Um, but but they obviously want to see more. Right. You know, you come once you want to come again and continue to see more of Alberta. Something else is really also unique is we are investing uh, more than any other province in indigenous tourism. So we're putting about $6 million over three years, uh, which is helping tourism operators, indigenous tourism operators, um, you know, share the culture of Alberta, uh, share the Alberta indigenous culture with visitors. And you'd be, you wouldn't be surprised, uh, you shouldn't be surprised rather, but people from overseas want to see authentic indigenous tourism experiences here in Canada. Uh, they hear about it over there. They want to come and they want to see it. And so we're already seeing uh, lots of investment there in places like Métis Crossing. Uh, they have the sky watching domes. Come and see the Aurora Borealis and so much more. Well, Minister, you have a you have a great ministry. It's easy to uh, it's easy to be passionate about it. I know you are. Thanks for talking to us. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Bruce. Take care. All right. There's Minister of Tourism and Sport, Joseph Scow, joining us on the program. And that does it for the Alberta Update this week as we take a first-hand look at some of the issues in the province and uh, what the decision makers are up to on your behalf. We will do these weekly when the Alberta Legislature is sitting and every other week when it is not. We'll be taking a, a bit of a break over the, uh, the Christmas season. We'll let you know when that is. And remember, you can always view the update uh, on your Alberta YouTube page or the Premier's at AB Danielle Smith. And make sure to subscribe to the Alberta Update on YouTube. Just go to youtube.com, open the app, and you search your Alberta or AB Danielle Smith. Uh, then you hit the subscribe button. It is just that easy. And that does it for this week's edition of the Alberta Update. Thank you for being with us. We appreciate you sharing some time with us, and we'll see you again next time.